No, you can't run and hide from this right. Good afternoon. How is everybody? Thank you for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, just quick, I need to figure out how I get to my presentation. So I serve as, um, I'm a pediatrician, but I've served for the last year, uh, a little over a year, as Congressional Fellow for Physicians for National Health Program. Um, <coughs> prior to that, I was, and still am, co-chair of our Maryland chapter of Physicians for National Health Program. So I've spent quite a bit of uh, time in Washington as well, um, particularly over this past year and a half. And um, what Dr. Milstein did was uh, do a very, um, great presentation of kind of where our political system is right now and what was designed to be, or what was considered to be politically feasible, but what our organization argues as a nonpartisan organization that um, is, is based on, on the evidence of what works in healthcare reform and what doesn't, much as I'm sure you are um, interested, is to look at the practical feasibility. So while the political feasibility wasn't that we could actually have a discussion about health policy in terms of what was best for our nation and what would bring us into maybe one of the top health systems in the world, um, it was based on what was able to be passed. And, uh, and we know that what was passed is not going to address the problems that we still have. So let me just give you a start by giving you, well, this quote. So I, um, for the medical students and residents here, does anybody know who said this and when they said this? Um, the evidence is conclusive that our people do not yet receive all the benefits they could from modern medicine for the rich and near rich. There is no real problem since they can command the very best science has to offer among the majority of the population. However, there are great islands of untreated or partially treated cases. Although it is a principle far reaching and perhaps of revolutionary significance, I think there are few who would deny that our ultimate objective should be to make these benefits available in full measure to all people. Does anybody know who said that? No, it was actually right here. Dr. Wilbur, the first dean of the Stanford Medical School in 1932. <laughs> he was on the uh, uh, a commission during the Depression um, that looked at quality. Here you go, Committee on the Cost of Medical Care. So I want to start with looking at how our nation compares to other nations. And this, I think, is a, a, is a particularly important slide. Because if you look at the per capita uh, yearly costs of health care in other industrialized nations, you can see that we spend two times, or sometimes more than that, than the other nations do. And that those nations actually cover all of their people and have better health outcomes and higher levels of satisfaction than we have here. If you look at the red bar at the bottom of the U.S. spending, that's our public spending. So we're already spending more in public dollars than the other industrialized nations are per capita. Do we get a very good value for this? Well, no. And actually, the census data came out last week on Thursday and showed that our, our current number of uninsured in this country is 50.6 or 7 million, which is a jump of over 4 million in the last year, the highest jump that we've had since those numbers have been um, recorded. And what's interesting is that it actually would have been more than 10 million people becoming uninsured, but our public programs were able to pick up 5.8 million people. So we're leaving a large portion and a growing portion of our population out. And I'll get into whether the new legislation addresses that or not. Now, we don't do very well as well in terms of, of preventable deaths in this country. And this was a study that looked at, at 19 different countries that could be compared and said, well, if each of these countries was functioning as well as one of the top performing countries, how many deaths would be prevented. And you can see at the bottom is that the U.S. is at the bottom of an estimated 101,000 excess deaths per year. Um, and what do we get in terms of health outcomes for all the money that we're spending? Mm -hmm. I don't think that we're getting a very good value for our dollar. You can see that our life expectancies are lower, our infant mortalities are high. In some areas of our country, our infant mortality is as high as what you would see in a third world nation. Our maternal mortality, embarrassingly high. And then looking in terms of, of technology, we don't rank up there with countries that have the most technology. And in this country, we actually ration our health care based on ability to pay. So this is an important concept, especially for the young people to understand, is that if you look at, at how much is spent on each person, look at the, at the deciles of health spending in a year, we call this the 80-20 rule. You can see that about any given population, about 80% of that population is relatively healthy and has low health care costs. But there's a 20% that actually, for now, or in this slide from 1999, accounted for over 80% of the health care costs. 
This 20% of the sickest is a very fluid group. Any one of us can come in, in and out of that group at any time. A good a friend of ours in, in Maryland was hit by a car recently riding her bike, and suddenly uh, this young 30-year-old healthy person was in this 20% um, group. The insurance companies in this country are trying to insure those in the 80% group here. And so what happens with the other 20% is that they often end up either uninsured or in one of our public pro pro programs. And so our public programs are, are carrying the heaviest burden of, of caring for those with lower socioeconomic status, um, those who are disabled, and those who are in the elderly population. While the, the insurance companies are collecting from primarily a, a healthy working force you know, people and um, not having to spend too much out. The beauty of single payer is if that everybody is paying into one fund, 100% of people are paying into one single pool, there's more than enough money to take care of the people in that 20% when they need it. So you're paying in and when, you're, when you need it, the system is there for you. Um, this is one of my favorite slides, just showing the growth of physicians over time and then the growth of administrators. Oh, my <laughs> So, um, you know, this is 3,000% up here at the top. What, what's behind this? What's going on here? Well, we have hundreds of insurance plans in this country, and for those insurance plans, you need people that can develop those insurance plans, people that can market those insurance plans, people that can determine which plan you're eligible for, and then once you are in a plan, they have to determine which doctor can you see, which care can you give, and then the doctors have to interface with the insurance plans and send their bills to the different plans whose rules are changing arbitrarily, very frequently, and then the hospitals have to have whole floors of billing departments to deal with all these different plans. And so about a third of our health care dollars are going to non-health care. We compare this to a Medicare, where traditional Medicare spends about 2 to 3% um, of its dollars on administration. For our private insurers, they spend 15 to 20% on administration, but then you have the whole other piece, which is what we as doctors spend or hospitals spend. Um, I'm a primary care pediatrician. A primary care doctor in this country spends about $70,000 a year out of their practice just interfacing with the insurance companies. Oh now, um, that's a pretty big chunk of money for primary care where our pay is not that big. Um, and so another problem in our country is with the insurance that we have, we don't have what we call health security, which is what people in other nations enjoy. People with health insurance can still go bankrupt when they become ill. And this study showed that about 80% of those who went into bankruptcy, um, the highest cause of bankruptcy, 62% of our bankruptcy is due to medical problems, 80% of them had health insurance at the onset of their illness. But you run into either not being able to work and so losing your, your benefit, losing your job and losing your benefits. Many people can't afford the COBRA that would allow them to extend their insurance when they lose their jobs. Or they run into the fact that their services aren't covered or that they have high deductibles and co-payments that they can't afford. So a very sad <coughs> fact is that about 2 million people in our country who are diagnosed with cancer forego treatment based on cost. And we find this unacceptable because the U.S. is an outlier. The other industrialized nations have figured out how to do this, and they use a model that's very different from ours. We've tried this market model of using private investor-owned insurers now for a few decades, and we've seen that it has failed, clearly. We're the most expensive, but we have poor health outcomes. We have increasing health disparities. We have preventable deaths, too many of those. We're losing our primary care doctors. And in Maryland, our medical society just did a physician survey. It showed that about 95% of physicians in Maryland said that health insurance companies either restricted or severely restricted their ability to practice quality medicine. And 77% of our doctors in Maryland are planning to leave practice early or drop insurance altogether. Uh, we just had our, our house delegates meeting last weekend, and, uh, and it was to a person. People are feeling that they cannot remain in private practice in this environment. And we're growing in terms of the people that are underinsured and uninsured. And so underinsured, if you're not familiar with that concept, are people who have health insurance, but they still face financial barriers to care or face financial consequences if they have a serious illness. As a physician, and as the, those of you who are going to be physicians, we take an oath to serve and to practice with conscience and dignity. But I argue that in this environment, in the healthcare crisis that we currently live in, that it's our responsibility, our professional responsibility, to say that this is unacceptable. And so while the political feasibility may be one thing, 
we have to keep our eye on the practical feasibility and advocate for the patients that we are supposed to take care of. Just to add um, one more piece, I'm sure you're aware of the growing income inequalities in this nation. And so under this uh, legislation, which is going to be, again, forcing people to purchase private insurance, I wonder how well people are going to be able to afford to pay for that or pay for the out-of-pocket costs. Um, and I also argue that, that the situation in this country is it's not just access to health care alone, but we're in a real crisis of uh, social and economic justice um, where we're seeing deterioration on many fronts. Um, there are, are slides showing the United States compared to other countries in terms of based on our income inequality, how are our outcomes of social well-being doing? And we're an outlier on all of those with, with low education, with high incarceration, with high homicide, low trust. Um, so a lot of issues that are important to our social well-being. So what did we get under the um, so interestingly named Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act? Um, this was based on a mandate model. The employer mandate was first offered by President Nixon in the 1970s, and then the employer and individual mandate were Republican uh, proposals during the 1990s. What we got was a Medicaid expansion. Um, so we expanded the level, the income level, up to which you know, patients can qualify for Medicaid. We have a, a mandate for those who do not qualify for public programs to purchase private insurance, and we're using our public dollars to help them purchase that private insurance, although there are no premium caps on that private insurance. So we're pouring our, our public dollars into the private industry, that very industry which wrote the legislation and um, to their benefit. And what did they get in return if, if they agreed to the individual mandate, or if we agreed to the individual mandate that we would have people purchase their product, that they would accept some regulation. But how well is that working out? Just recently we saw on Thursday, that was the six month anniversary of the legislation, uh, one of the provisions that kicked in was that they can no longer deny new policies to children 19 years of age and under who have a pre-existing condition. So what are the insurance companies doing? On Wednesday we saw in the LA Times that uh, Blue Anthem, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and Aetna and other insurers have decided to drop new policies to children under 19 years of age because it's a product. For insurance companies, it's not about health. It's about selling a product, a health insurance product. And if you're a business and that product is no longer beneficial to you, then you have no reason to continue to offer that product. We're the only nation that uses this model of health insurance. The other countries that have private insurances use a very different social insurance model. 